Peace and love, everyone. I'm here again with uh, David Davidja Buckland, an author of uh, one book now. He's got another one uh, on the way. This one is uh, Our Natural Potential. Mm -hmm. And he has a blog. He is uh, what I would consider a, a pioneer in the uh, within the realm of uh, cognition and description uh, and is someone that I truly appreciate. So I'm grateful to be back with him again and uh, witnessing the unfoldment of these types of discussions. So thank you, David. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. That's beautiful. Um, yeah, I thought it would be really useful to uh, go into a little more about uh, the topics of divinity and refined perception and so on that we touched on previously. Uh, we, we shared that. Um, but it's useful, I think, to distinguish the distinction between belief and experience. Mm. For me, when I, when I was younger, <clears throat> I was brought up in a, in a uh, Protestant uh, family, went to church and Sunday school and so on as, as a child, and came to categorize words like God and and uh, divinity and, and faith and so on in the category of, of belief, and largely uh, in a negative way. <laughs> the, you know, the idea of this vengeful, vengeful old man sitting in a chair in the sky just didn't make a lot of sense to me, and uh, I came to reject such things. But at a certain point, you know, in, in my own experience, at a certain point, I uh, became interested in Eastern spirituality and, and uh, I took up meditation and, and, um, and actually not after not all that long um, meditation not only connects you with this with the consciousness within but um, similar practices also but uh, there's a tendency for perception to refine or to existing refinement to be uh, revived again Mm -hmm. um, sometimes what happens is young children have, have uh, subtle perceptions and so on uh, and experiences but that becomes repressed as we become adults because it's rejected by the adults around us uh, or um, or it's made fun of or, or whatever um, and so you know for many of us we, we move into a place of, of disbelief or you know we might have you know, drift into an agnostic kind of position that that um, that we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, we haven't made up our mind, and often because we haven't really actually spent a lot of time thinking about it. Just it just what we heard when we were kids wasn't what we liked. But anyway, so I I took up meditation, and after a little bit of time, um, subtle perceptions began to unfold, and I started to have experiences of what we would normally call. Uh, divine or or um, uh, subtle beings, and but because of that background uh, myself, where I kind of rejected that kind of stuff, it was sort of like, what the heck is this? And and uh, there was a real um, uh, what's the word? Not complete dismissal because it was I was experiencing it, but uh, I was pretty circumspect about it. Put it that way. Uh, it's like oh, okay, what's this? But but you know, in this case for me, the um, the a form of uh, to get what they call Krishna showed up and um, and pointed out a feature of the subtle environment that I hadn't noticed before, which allowed me to go beyond that into a, a deeper level. Mm. And actually, that happened several times. Different forms of of the divine would show up and point out some feature of the environment I hadn't noticed yet, and that allowed me to go still deeper. And uh, I came to see the process as being uh, guided, that there was a hand. And, and in time, I experienced other types of beings and um, subtle beings. And, and um, that There's an important distinction here that I think we should make about uh, subtle beings or between subtle beings and divine beings. Yeah. Yes. That's a good point. Yes, there is, uh, uh, you know, like a, an alligator is divine from a certain perspective, uh, yeah. in the sense that it's an expression of divinity, 
but not all subtle beings are divine in the way that you're referring yeah, to. Them. And that's a very good point. And one of the things is, you know, if you go into the subtle levels, for example, you come to the level of, of you know, first we have the physical experience and then we have our emotional experience and then our mental experience and then the intellect and intuition and, and so on into more mm -hmm. refined levels. And on each of those levels, there are uh, types of beings, as I've discovered, I discovered from experience, there's different types of beings that, that reside. Um, humans between lifetimes and angels and uh, uh, people who are not cooperating with the process so much. They don't want to deal with their stuff and so they become kind of more uh, what I called at one point rabble. They're, they're you know, troublemakers and sometimes attention seekers. Yeah. So they can, they can try and draw our attention and because they're subtle, some people make the mistake of assuming that oh, they're subtle, must be an angel or yeah. <laughs> they're a guide or some, some subtle being. And, 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 you know, the advice I give around that is to pay attention to the feeling value. Because mm -hmm. they can, because it's sort of on a mental or like what we might consider dream level, they can take, some of them beings can take whatever form they choose or, or they can, you know, create some appearance or give some fancy name that um, might appeal to us. But, um, but if we pay attention to the feeling value, we can get a better sense of, of what they're actually about. Yeah, another uh, another helpful pointer along yeah. those lines is to uh, expose or check in with another uh, another point that has some experience, just to uh, reflect back to see if your seeing is is clear. You know. Yes, right. And another another value I discovered with the with the uh, divine being, who I, I felt that they had my back as well. Mm -hmm. Because when you know exploring on subtler levels, I mean, not that I spent a huge amount of time doing this, but just here and there it would come up, and I would uh, be exploring some level. At one point, um, one of the things that's useful to understand about the subtle world is that it's what I call nested. That there's essentially worlds within worlds, mm -hmm. um, spaces within spaces, and um, and so there's what what in the Vedic tradition refers to as lokas or worlds, mm -hmm. and uh, and so you can run into, there's kind of like the, the, the larger global space and then there's spaces within that. And so certain types of, <laughs> of beings will tend to congregate in certain worlds or, or create a world of their group consciousness and, um, and congregate there any, anyways. And so at one point, for example, I, I wandered into a space that was kind of a, <laughs> a um, I'm not sure we got a, a pretty sterile kind of plane that was kind of dark and and uh, not much going on no plant life or, or, or equivalent um, and then I discovered that it was a place where the, some darker beings uh, hung out and as soon as I discovered this they discovered me because of you know the way of consciousness attention works mm -hmm. they're very aware of a different consciousness in there and uh, also the what immediately happened was that the divine beings who were uh, assisting whatever were there right on uh, right away and they knew how to deal with that kind of stuff I, I was clueless about what to do uh, but they were right on it and so I recognized that they also had my back and so for, for me very very slowly I learned to uh, trust and, um, and uh, appreciate and, and value what they could offer I mean, I've always been a bit circumspect because it's very easy to to fool yourself and and uh, you know have have dream ideas about uh, you know your invisible friend like you were in a child. You can do an yes, adult yeah. version of that. You know? <laughs> of um, so it, it's still yeah, like you mentioned, uh, getting outside verification and so on. Um, I have had the opportunity to get outside verification of, of some of these. Uh, not exactly objective verification, but some of these kinds of experiences. There tends to be somewhat common ways that they're experienced, but they don't always use the same names. Um, they don't always appear exactly the same way because of, I call it personalization, because it's kind of that field of mind and, and dreams and so on like that. There's that, that pliability of appearances. Um, yeah. And so beings can appear a certain way because of our expectations from our, our cultural background or whatever. Uh, our expectations as well. Um, uh, a classic example for me would be uh, angels. Uh, they're often portrayed in the West as having wings. And so, you know, and having flowing robes and so on like that. 
So a lot of people will tend to experience angels as having wings and flying robes, sort of like you see in those classic paintings. Yeah. But that's just a, a, a way of seeing them, a, a way that they, could, they may want to present themselves um, so you can relate to them. Uh, but um, in actual fact, they live on a level of essentially that they're intelligent energy. And mm -hmm. uh, they're kind of like, uh, almost could be described as intelligent clouds of colored energy. Uh, uh, and then they can take an appearance to, in order to, you know, relate to uh, someone like ourselves who expect a, a face. And <laughs> yes, yes. And so on. Um, but it's but it's important to again. It's important to to see to recognize that that's an appearance, and it's convenient for communicating. But it's that feeling, value, and, and the qualities behind that that's more important. Exactly. And, yeah. It's, and what uh, they're communicating is going to tend to be less about words and more about feelings and, and uh, information, uh, beautiful, intuition, I'd say, yeah. Beautiful point. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a checking in for a, a qualitative consistency because the, as you said, the content, you know, tends to sort of shape shift a lot. And uh, when we're in tune with those uh, fundamental spiritual qualities, you know, that uh, more clearly reflect uh, divinity, then we're able to, you know, test the resonance of that. And one thing I wanted to go back to just for a little bit of context for the, for the listeners is when you're speaking about uh, nested, nested spaces and these uh, lokas, you know, worlds within worlds, it's all right here. It's not something other elsewhere. It's in this, this field of our own conscious awareness. Yeah, as you get to know who you are on those deeper levels. Um, and it's also valuable to mention that, that too on this, that a lot of the Eastern spiritual orientation, that's the way it's presented uh, in current time, is a denial of all that stuff. Yeah. And a, com and a complete emphasis on the detached mm -hmm. uh, observer and the uh, denial of, of the content of experience and, uh, and so on. Um, and there's a value in that in the first stage of, towards the first stage of enlightenment, because it is in that quiet silence and, uh, and detachment that uh, many people find a way to uh, connect to their, their nature as infinite consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that, which is the container of all that. And it, it's the kind of uh, global consciousness is kind of the ultimate space, the ultimate container, the container of, the, of all containers, or, uh, the, the source of, of, of all of it. So it, uh, getting to know that first before you get too much into this other stuff is very valuable because it's very easy to get lost in, in other worlds and other, because there's, you know, I don't know, it not, I don't want to say infinite, but there's gazillions of possibilities of other worlds and that, but you're in a human body you're having a human experience, it's important to live in a human life and, and not spend a whole bunch of time off in other kinds of places. Um, yes. and, and in fact, some of those kinds of techniques where people uh, culture uh, detachment from the body and going off into other places astrally or so on, um, tend to actually be uh, detrimental spiritually because mm -hmm. you're, you're the important part of spiritual development is integration of mind, body, spirit, you know, integrating all those parts together and taking a part of it and going off in another direction or, or uh, other kinds of things. Uh, it tends to be contrary to that. Yeah. Well, we're wandering off sideways here. <laughs> but, no, that's fine. That's, uh, there's some... but it, uh, that's important. Uh, so, so from my perspective, and, and I'm sure yours also, um, you know, from your, your approach, um, is the, the importance of a, a balanced uh, a balanced approach to 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 develop that inner consciousness that uh, inner clarity mm -hmm. and that provides that stable unchanging uh, backdrop uh, of our, our fundamental reality for which we can unfold this other stuff without being tossed and turned around by it exactly um, then it's uh, but, then it's self to self it's not within the realm of otherness Yes. No, we're not dealing with, which is really where a lot of the trickiness can, can come into play when we're not clear about yeah. ourselves. And, a lot of, and if we've got uh, unresolved emotional 
uh, mm. dynamics going on. It's very difficult to tune into the finer feeling values because it's kind of overshadowed by the emotional noise uh, of old dynamics that are unresolved trying to come to the surface and be experienced. It creates a kind of a fog, but it also creates the hazard of unmet needs that can be appealed to by uh, less savory beings or um, or uh, the imagination and uh, that kind of thing. So, you know, personal traps, just like in the world, we can get misled by, uh, you know, certain kinds of people are happy to, 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 to take advantage of, of people and, uh, uh, and certain types of to, to certain, certain neighborhoods are not as desirable. Um, you know, it's the same kind of a thing, uh, the same kind of rules, you know, don't talk to strangers and, <laughs> you know, yeah. Those kind of those kind of basic principles we learn as kids uh, that they serve uh, subtle level as well too, um, yeah. And uh, and you also have, have had a, a, pro a similar pro well, similar, but you've also had a process of unfolding that, um, yourself that way. Would you like to share with that? Sure. Yeah. I, uh, you know, as far as going back to the uh, the the belief. Uh, uh, ex versus experience um, investigation. I also was uh, not really steeped in uh, a religious environment, but we went to church, you know, every once in a while. And uh, I think I was more encouraged to be involved with the youth, the youth group and those kinds of things. But in terms of childhood, uh, tastes or or experiences of something greater there was there was there was a lot there but there wasn't a context that fit what was um, what had been tasted you know so this the typical protestant you know model of god and uh and mankind and everything that uh seems to be going on in that uh, linear unfoldment uh, just wasn't supportive of there being any real reflection of the tastes that had uh, been had or had shown forth in some of the earlier years. So being around religion, it wasn't that uh, there was necessarily a, a strong aversion or mm, a disillusionment, disillusionment with it developed, but at a certain point, uh, what began to take place after uh, some very uh, transformative uh, experiencing had unfolded was that it became like a shoe that uh, was just a bit too tight. It didn't fit anymore. Yeah. And so I was trying to walk around in this, you know, shoe that was two sizes too small. And the, the experiential reality was something much greater. You know, I was aware, you know, aware of the presence of God and there was a certainty in that. And it wasn't a belief. It wasn't something that was coming or going. It uh, didn't have anything to do with, uh, you know, conditional environment or, or anything along those lines. And at, at a certain point, I remember just uh, being in this uh, place of appearing to have a choice, you know, to either uh, continue to, to, kind of go along with this or to step out of it and that step out of it was taken but it wasn't taken in a way that was you know kind of uh, pushing that off as being false or anything along those lines but just kind of holding it in a broader uh, a broader understanding a broader recognition of reality and then exploring some of the eastern uh, traditions by the time that started to take place here uh, you know, similar to yourself, it was already what these scriptures were talking about was already uh, blossoming forth as an experiential reality. So I wasn't reading things and then saying, oh, what's that about? When I read it, when I read a book like the Bhagavad Gita or uh, the Upanishads or something along these lines, there was an inner knowing. I knew what it was pointing to because that was what was uh, shining forth here. And I was really, you know, blessed in that respect to, by the time I encountered a lots of different sort of cultural uh, perspectives, there was enough flexibility, enough fluidity to kind of move between them and recognize the universal 
underlying truth that was present in all of these. Yeah. Um, I have, I have myself come back to some of that myself too. Uh, um, um, I've been studying world religions and, and uh, yes, yes. became ordained uh, as an interfaith minister and so on. Uh, but, um, but yeah, it was definitely coming from a very different context than, than originally. Yeah, that's and it's what's fascinating about it is that even though you know we seem to come from two different contexts, we kind of are here together, sharing in this unified uh, recognition of the truth of what we are and exploring uh, the same topics, which are which are very relevant for for both of these points of experiencing. So it just goes to show that no matter where it is that we're coming from, and no matter how tight we feel our background is or you know whatever it is uh, that's appearing as the content of our of our history the possibility or the potentiality is that it can blossom forth into a very full and comprehensive uh, recognition of what reality is well put yes uh, there's a book uh, called american data that talks about the uh, migration of Eastern thought into the West and the, and the major proponents of that and some of the things that happened with their organizations and so on. And I found it quite insightful because one of the things uh, uh, he pointed out in there was that the Western model was that the priest was the liaison with God and you, uh, you, you, know, you had to indirect, your relationship with God was, was indirect. And whereas the Eastern model was where you could have a direct relationship with God. Mm. And I think that that, um, I, I don't think that was an original uh, uh, teaching of Christianity, but but um, I, I think that's an, an important thing to recognize that that uh, it is possible to have a direct relationship with the divine, and it's not it doesn't need to be about belief, um, you know. And, I, and I'm, I talked about angels and dark beings and so on like that a little bit. Uh, just I do I do want to emphasize that that's not particularly important uh, in a day to day context and so on. Um, the reason I, I mentioned that was primarily just because it's more than possible to experience them uh, over time and uh, and understanding that that's a possibility is, is really valuable for mm -hmm. um, uh, for it, but uh, I, I wouldn't see them as a, as a goal or, or yeah, exactly. It's like not chasing know, experiences or anything. It's yeah, it's like getting to know that there's there's bald eagles that live down by the water over here that do, like to fish and and there's there's you know there's a, a cedar grove over there that's uh, you know it's just exactly. part of the, it's part of the the larger environment as you get to know the larger context of yourself. Right, and oftentimes it's intelligent to uh, become you know become aware if there is an uh, a copperhead nest you know over in this section of the woods. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to just go wandering about uh, thinking that everything's hunky dory and <laughs> in for a rude, uh, a rude awakening there. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's good to know that there's 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 uh, there's great blessings and and value and and so on. But there's also there's all yeah there's the dark spots too. Exactly. Yeah, um, and another aspect of this too that's uh, we've touched on in previous uh, conversations, but uh, in case they haven't been heard before, and that is uh, what's sometimes called the the masculine feminine uh, mm. aspects of the path. And um, I mean, it's not really a, a gender kind of a thing. It's it's more just a flavor, uh, a flavor. Um, when we look at the fundamental nature of consciousness, it has this uh, these kind of three aspects. There's the the observer, which tends to be experienced as a detached, um, un uninvolved observer, a witness of, of, of the experiences. Then there's the field of experience, the objects of experience, uh, and there's the process between them. And generally speaking, earlier on in the process, that uh, observer and observed dynamic is, is like a masculine and feminine duality. Mm -hmm. And um, eventually, in the process, we go into what I refer to as unity consciousness. Those two become one, and they mm -hmm. merge into one wholeness. Uh, but prior to that, there there tend to be experienced as a duality. And as we touched on briefly earlier, there's a, uh, some of the Eastern teachings that are that have come, the way they're interpreted these days is a, there's an emphasis on the renunciate side, 
which tends to be more a masculine, dispassionate observer, um, and uh, and a, a world is illusion kind of approach. So the the, the feminine or the, the the field of the world is dismissed as uh, illusion and to be ignored. And certainly, if you are on a renunciate path, which the vast minority of <laughs> or not, or not, you know, that vast majority of us are not, yeah. um, then you know you want to be detached from the world. Then yes, it's 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 certainly understandable. But that's a bit been a bit overemphasized uh, for historical reasons, and uh, that correlates uh, with the with the darker age. Yeah, the yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly, and uh, appropriate in the context of, of the of the cycles of the planetary emergence. Yes, and right. most of us are are, are householders, and, and uh, you know we're here to be live in the world, as I, I mentioned earlier, and so it's a bit matter of touching into that source and then bringing it forward into our experience, not living our life off in subtle realms or or in, just in pure consciousness in a cave somewhere, but but touching into that and then bringing it out into the world. Mm -hmm. And so a balance, from my perspective, a balanced path um, is one that in integrates both sides of the equation. Mm -hmm. And uh, in the stages of enlightenment model I use, there is a kind of an alternating process that can happen if there's a, if, if there's a more balanced process where there's a unfolding of, of stages in consciousness, the, the more masculine side of the process, but there's also an unfolding of uh, refined perception and the awakening heart and so on like that. Uh, some people also talk about the duality as a heart-mind kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. it's kind of the dispassionate intellect uh, on the one level and then the heart uh, on another. And um, some of the the uh, approaches, the spiritual approaches these days, uh, because there's a denial of the of the um, the experience experiential side. Um, there's a de-emphasis on healing and uh, resolving emotional stuff and, and so on as well. And so, it's, so sometimes you get into issues around bypassing where people try to avoid all their, all their stuff and just mm. go off into their spiritual practices and trying to avoid the world, which isn't, isn't a very integrated process and actually doesn't lead to a, even to an initial uh, detached awakening because <laughs> you're not dealing with your stuff that's in the way of that. Um, but even more so with the uh, with the refined side and the awakening heart, uh, as I mentioned, you, it's difficult to open the the heart to the to, to the bigger universal uh, values of love when you have a, a tangle of emotions and anger and fear and other, whatever uh, unresolved uh, past. Um, one way I think about it that I often use is 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 that. Um, we have the we can have these big experiences, positive or negative, um, and it takes. You know, we then have to process it. The mind, the body, the emotions have, have to be processed afterwards, and that happens a lot in dreams and and so on after big experiences. But sometimes there's pieces of the there's so much of it that we have to kind of put it off a little bit, come back to it later. But then we may not we we may repress that and and, and go into a stress response instead, and you know. Avoidance or, or uh, uh, you know, fight, flight, freeze uh, dynamics, or we try to to respond to it. Different people respond to it in different ways, but in essence, some kind of avoidance or repression of the of the uh, what we don't want to deal with yet, and and so it tends to build up over time. But because that's that energy is seeking its resolution, it tends mm -hmm. to leak out in different ways. Uh, in our experience and also in events in our lives. Uh, yeah. And so we have what people call karma and, and appearing and, and events and, and uh, 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 irrational or overreactive uh, dynamics and so on like that, all over symptoms of stuff to be healed. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we're going to integrate the heart side and, and that we uh, then we also not just needing a technique of transcending and going beyond, but also uh, healing and, and uh, learning to be, not just to be with the silence, but also to be with what's here in, in all its facets, to be what's here in our experience as well, and, and to heal that. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, you, uh, you wrote a beautiful article on that, uh, I think in the last day or so. So for all the listeners, I would check that out. It's uh, very helpful. It's, uh, I just want to kind of bring in a couple of, uh, uh, 
a twist on perspective here, just going back to where we were talking about kind of the traditional Western approach to uh, spirituality and everything. And it kind of ties into this masculine feminine understanding, which is so, I find just to be so supportive and really vital for, for full unfoldment. Uh, what I've observed in the past, I don't know, I'm, uh, this isn't the oldest body around, but in the past, uh, you know, five or six years is that there has been a shift collectively, uh, e even within the realm of Christianity. You know, when I look out, there's these uh, grace-based churches that are springing up all over, particularly here in the South. And it's kind of this new approach that let's go of the rules and the regulations and even let's go of hell sometimes, you know, the idea of being punished or, or put away or anything like that and start stepping into this kind of more feminine uh, approach to the whole uh, um, presentation of that uh, particular religious flavor. So it's really fascinating. And I, I know that it correlates with what's taking place collectively, you know, and it yeah, also... Similar, I'm seeing a similar thing at the Science and Non-Duality Conference where they're talking mm -hmm. a lot about more about the heart and about embodiment. And it's still not, uh, you know, fully flowered yet, but there's a lot more about actually living it in the world and about, about, uh, you know, being real and, uh, of course, and yeah, similar. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. And that, that has its limitations too, which I want to come back to in just a, in <laughs> just a um, so the, what, what I was going to kind of bring it around to is in terms of masculine and feminine um, development, you know, even when someone has a lot of refined perception, I don't necessarily consider that that's, uh, feminine development in a field status, you know, in the status of the, of recognizing one's reality to be the field. Mm. So there, I think it's important to kind of make a, a little bit of a distinction there in, in the sense that, uh, you know, we could be working on a lot of kind of emotional healing or different areas, but in terms of actual shifting into a new, recognition of what our identity is the masculine feminine actually refers to the aspects of the field yeah you you would agree with yes. that yes yeah, yeah. You, you make a good point because for example what i was talking about with with my inner debate and and those early experiences of the divine and and uh that, that kind of stuff all that happened uh, quite a long time before i woke up mm -hmm. virtually so it was it was on the level of of experiences Mm -hmm. experiential so it was a value and, and it was it was much superior to just belief it was a direct experience so you know the, what, what i used to say at the time was if somebody asked me if i believed in god i would ask them if they believed in strawberries right yeah, exactly. it's like it's it's obvious i mean it's not a question of belief if it's your direct experience and yeah. but for some people that was uh, they understood that and some did not mm -hmm. but there's a very different different big difference between that and yes and and it being the uh uh, yeah, the masculine and feminine, we're talking about that on a much more uh, uh, fundamental level. Yes, yes, exactly. <laughs> and uh, part of that process, but yeah, but it's... A bunch yes, of course, yeah, it's a, it's a part, but it doesn't necessarily spell kind of the, the, the expansiveness to which we're, we're uh, pointing towards, yeah, or we're sort of sharing it. And uh, one thing that's fascinating uh, also, and that's what I, I love talking to you uh, because you're really one of the only ones that I can kind of, you know, deeply talk to these things about um, is that what I've noticed recently in some of the shifts that I'm observing is that there's more of a feminine uh, qualitative dominance to the shift. Yeah. So this means that there's actually the recognition of like a, the, the vibrant fullness of the, the, the field of self-observing or self-consciousness and then the, the awareness, the, the seer aspect is recognized after that. So the sap aspect, the, what's been called the colorless sap, actually oftentimes is being recognized first and sometimes an actual shift into the recognition of that as self is shining forth prior to any recognition of one's uh, self as, the, as awareness. Now, of course, they're not... Yeah. They're not two, they're not separate, so it's always there, but it doesn't click in, in until after this. So it's, it's, it's almost like, you know, divinity is really pulsing forth this, uh, this new qualitative uh, 
presentation within the field. And I think it kind of ties into what I was saying about Christianity on some level and uh, yeah. just our collective. Uh, That's actually quite significant uh, yeah. because, because we've been rising out of a darker age and into, mm -hmm. a, into a higher age of light. Um, there has been that renuncius emphasis we talked about before because it was necessary to withdraw from the world to make any, any uh, real prog progress uh, spiritually. That's no longer the case. Mm -hmm. um, but it's still been the case that um, the best way to wake up was to, to transcend the world and into the, into the silence and mm -hmm. discover consciousness within. Yeah. Uh, and that's been the, the case for many people in my generation and so on mm -hmm. like that. Um, but if people are now beginning to wake up to the, to the consciousness <laughs> in the world, that, that, that speaks to a much, much higher level mm -hmm. of, of clarity in the world than, than may be apparent yet. Uh, yeah. It's a really, really good sign. Of, of yeah, it is. Yeah, this is, uh, this yeah. is like, you know, groundbreaking, I think, it, at least yeah. to be talking about it on, on a, um, on a computer, you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> and uh, it's, it's really, yeah, we're just, uh, we're in a really amazing uh, period, you know, kind of witnessing yeah. all this. And, and uh, to speak to this a little bit more too, uh, one of the things about when you, when you have a masculine detached uh, dominant process, then mm -hmm. you're much more likely to be talking in terms of emptiness and mm -hmm. uh, world Great. disillusion and, um, uh, or, or quite a flat kind of pro even if it, there's a there's a very clear awakening it can be quite a flat uh, process where when there's more of that the feminine side that's where the fullness is that, yeah. that open space of consciousness yeah. is a big space but it's not an empty space it's full it's just rich and full and yeah. alive and it's lit up and, and yes. it, it turns out I, I used to thought that think that it was the liveness of consciousness that made it lit up but it actually turns out to be essentially divinity right. beyond that that's <laughs> leaking through into it <laughs> yeah that's but, what's so yeah. funny is that it uh it's almost like when it, when that reveals itself it's like duh that was it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it makes perfect sense but you don't see it until it's revealed by grace so <laughs> well it's interesting too because in the, in the tradition uh that i'm in too that they talk about um there's these these stages of enlightenment um, and there's a sort of a there's a certain number of stages, and then that 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 part of the process is complete. But the the feminine side, the refinement, and and um, uh, the degree of ability to awaken uh, to awaken the heart and embody more and more is mm -hmm. effectively infinite because there's just mm -hmm. so much to expand into and 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 learn and discover and and open mm -hmm. to. Uh, yes, I, but it's it's far. It, it, I mean, if if if, and that's the real disadvantage of not developing that side. You get to a certain point, and and your your development's going to stall out because there's no no further. To, uh, you reach the peak of how far you can go. You've gone beyond consciousness. There's no more. There's no more of that development to happen. So then then you know it, then it's and to go any further, it has to be refinement. And and you know with the stages, there's there's kind of the the self-realization, then what's known as God consciousness with the initially awakening heart. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, this is kind of an idealized format. And then there's the, the unity stage where those two sides of consciousness come together. Mm -hmm. And then there's refined unity where, where that development before is now in the context of unity and, and it fills out much more. You become infinite with everything in the world. Mm -hmm. And then, then there's the transcending of consciousness itself into what, what they call Brahman in the Vedic tradition or uh, Ajashanti calls the no capital S self, the mm. beyond self, beyond Atman yes. um, uh, stage of development. And that's kind of, the, that becomes the completion of, mm -hmm. of that process. And then you've got a quality of refined Brahman, which is kind of a bit obscure because how can you have refinement of a no thing or uh, right. that, that's a whole other topic we've talked about yeah. before. And then those two sides come together into what's called para-Brahman or pure divinity. Yeah. where you come to divinity itself without mm -hmm. just as we come in the transcendent uh in in samadhi or or Turiya, we come to that pure value of consciousness consciousness mm -hmm. without content mm -hmm. consciousness without without modification whatever in the same way we can go beyond consciousness and brahman and, all, and come to just pure divinity 
Yeah. And, uh, but again, that requires the feminine side to come to it. it um, uh, and, you know, there's some of the old texts, you know, when they talk about masculine and feminine, they use, they talk about uh, expressions like Shiva and Shakti. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there's often an emphasis on Shiva, but Shiva is dead without Shakti because Shiva is the power of life, or the power in general, and, and the, the, the movement and the flow. Uh, Shiva is just stillness, silent observing. He's, he, he brings alertness to the game, but that's it. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> interesting. Yeah, yeah. From the feminine. Beautiful. Yeah, I, uh, I'm reading a, a pretty kind of interesting, uh, a rare book, I would say, on some levels called the Radha Tantra. And uh, in, in it, uh, there's a similar line to what you said, but instead it says without shakti or without uh, this uh, particular form that it's referring to of the of the divine mother uh brahman is like a dead corpse so in, instead of saying shiva it even says that you know brahman is like a dead corpse without this the activation of that which presents the self you know the atman yeah. uh, as the as the uh, contrast to the nothing or nothingness of brahman yeah. and uh yeah, that's what uh, becomes becomes clear when there's clearing that's taking place. You know, <laughs> and that's essentially what tantra is is, is all about. Is is that mm -hmm. the shakti side, the, the the a part of it? And it's interesting, you know, in studying the tradition that I studied in, which is in the Shankara lineage, um, which a lot of the time appear, appears to have emphasized the the renunciate. Um, he revived the, the the monastic tradition in India. Um, and was a monk himself but he revived the whole thing and and there's a there's a, a point in his life where he goes through the the more detached uh, uh you know consciousness is everything kind of uh, uh uh period and then he has this there's a story that's told where he's he's uh walking along a river and his shoe gets stuck and he he can't he, he can't uh, he can't get his foot out of the, you know, unstuck and he sees a washwoman crossing a nearby bridge and calls out to her and, and she responds that oh, it's all illusion <laughs> and he realizes that it's the divine mother mm -hmm. and and he writes this beautiful poem about, about uh, the divine feminine and, and so on and realize and he realizes in the second part of his teaching he realizes that he brings out the, the divinity part, the, the feminine side of it. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. But a lot of a lot of what's been taught of his teaching in the West these days, uh, the new Advaita teaching, is, it emphasizes an aspect of the, his earlier teaching and doesn't bring out his, his later part. He also talked about, um, they have a thing uh, they talk about in, uh, the, the, an, another version is from the Sankhya tradition, they have the, the the duality is known as Purusha and Prakriti, mm -hmm. the, the kind of equivalent to the, the Shiva value and Shakti, the Prakriti means nature. And nature is composed of three fundamental qualities of, mm -hmm. of uh, Sattva, Rajas, and Tamas. It's essentially kind of purity and clarity, uh, movement or fire and inertia. And, and what, the, what he observed, <clears throat> What he observed was when inertia is dominant in our physiology, we experience the world around us as solid and real. When uh, rajas becomes dominant, which is quite common in, with spiritual practice, because rajas is transformation also, um, is, is that the world comes to be seen as illusory. And that's often taught as the truth, but it's actually a transitional experience. And then, and then when sattva becomes dominant, which which comes from that refinement and and uh, also soma, which is a whole other topic, but uh, uh, an essential, uh, purely a feminine kind of thing. Um, then then with sattva dominant, we experience the world as divine play. Mm. So it's so we kind of come to recognize that the world isn't an illusion; it's an appearance, which has a deeper flow that's going on. So the surface is illusory, but what's underlying that is not. It, it's it, it, there's a reality to it that's that's intimate to who we are and, and uh, the nature of divinity, uh, which unfolds over a period of time. Mm -hmm. um, the, no, the direct experience of that, and uh, so this 
complete dismiss dismissal of the world philosophically or, or whatever like that is, is, is not actually a particularly useful, especially if it's not your experience. It's, mm. it's useful to recognize that it's a stage we can go through, uh, yeah. but it's not a, a philosophy to adopt if it's not our direct experience and so on. It's a, it's a part of the process. Yeah. Yeah, and even in those stages to have a, a broader context is, is so supportive because it kind of moves us out of the realm of falling into that self-laid trap of feeling like this is, you know, this is it. Uh, or, you know, oh, yeah. and, uh, and, and then making decisions based on that or, or, or whatever the case may be. So having this teaching, teaching <laughs> would be one. <laughs> People yeah. get into that sometimes where they get... Because uh, because each stage, when you have a major shift, it, it's a it, it's a major shift in our sense of self and mm -hmm. our sense of the world, uh, what's real, and um, and even within the unity stage, there's there, there's a it's a progressive stage where we unify with, with more and more over time. Mm -hmm. um, it can cause a whole series of shifts in our sense of what's real, mm -hmm. and we get very used to that kind of changing. Um, mm -hmm. But the idea that that there's I, I, whatever, rather, but we, each of those changes can be very profound, and we can feel uh, a, a, a great completeness with that. We mm -hmm. can feel done, and we'll, somewhere or other, we'll, we'll have read that that's the truth or whatever. And it's certainly it's it's true. It's your experience. Uh, it's true in that moment. Um, but to ever think that we're done is really folly. Um, yeah yeah that's that's it's it's like a, a, a another bit of identity in there that's wanting to control and and uh and know that that i know the ultimate truth and and yeah. it's so easy to buy into that beautiful and, yeah, i like beautiful. to look at it as a a flower that just keeps blooming you know you think the petals are and then more petals are coming out from the center and it's just this perpetual blossoming and the flower doesn't have an ending you know yeah, I, I it's complete rose. but it's in process it's in process but it's complete yeah i saw a rose the other day on, on a, a single stem and one of the roses that was had opened was a beautiful yellow rose mm -hmm. and on this other branch was a beautiful pale red rose and then there was another was also a bud on that same of another red rose yeah. coming up on, on, wow. on the same stem which was really interesting to see. That is very fascinating. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's yeah, it's very curious to see, but it's um, but even with on the same branch, there's different expressions and and di at different stages of expression. Mm. Yeah. So it's uh, nature is like that, and to to ever think that we're done is done is is inertia. It's it's uh, it's preparing for dissolution. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, in that sense, we never really started to be done in the first place. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how it all ties into what we were talking about with the uh, with the collective and how things are kind of really shifting. And um, I think more and more what we're going to see and and what I'm and what I'm observing is these, you know, even tastes of radiance are starting to shine forth in early stages or even pre. Uh, in a regular taste of radiance are starting to shine forth even pre uh, initial shift sometimes so it's really miraculous uh, <laughs> and uh, you know there tends to be here uh, in in this teaching there's a, a emphasis on devotion you know in the flow of devotion and devotion to truth not any necessarily anything in particular although it can uh, direct itself in 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 certain ways but that uh, that level of devotional flow also I, I see becoming more uh, regular, you know, in the field of activity it, it, as we're witnessing this enlivening uh, within conscious awareness. And when we look at some of the models of the different, uh, or the at least what is present in writing that kind of uh, describes different ages, uh, we see that oftentimes human beings were just naturally devotional towards each other, towards each other. You know, it was uh, an expression of devotional relationship. We, you the know, heart to, was open. the heart was open to touch, to touch the feet, to acknowledge according to the Dharma and the structure and everything that was in place was just, that was just the way that life was, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and that's definitely, I'm 
starting to see that at least in the you know it's kind of interesting when we hang around a certain group because it could, you know <laughs> we, we're kind of seeing a certain unfoldment and uh not that i'm not out there you know at the grocery store and those kinds of things but it's different when you're interacting regularly yeah. and uh and and that's definitely happening and at least in smaller groups i i know for sure yeah. Yeah, and, and it's really beautiful to see also where where many in my generation uh, took up meditation in their late teens, early twenties, and, and meditated for decades, and uh, many essentially gave up on the possibility of, of uh, enlightenment in this lifetime, just because it was taking so long. Um, in spite of all these uh, promises they might have heard when they were younger, and uh, or hopes, and yet then then this shift started happening. Mm -hmm. um, around 2006 or seven, where far more people started shifting. Mostly people who've been meditating for a very long time uh, started shifting. Um, but what's happening now I'm seeing more of is, is more younger people shifting. Mm. Yeah. And they didn't have to go through those decades of practice. Uh, well, not, not in this lifetime, but. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Slow down. <laughs> Just yeah, well, it depends on how you want to prove. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I was... there, there are those. That, yeah, there is the idea that people say that that that, that some of the souls coming in now are coming in because that there is that possibility of of live, you know experiencing life from the because there is that that uh, when we talk about masculine and feminine, um, another way of framing that is is uh, from an Ayurvedic perspective is uh, Atman and Sattva, consciousness and clarity or purity, mm. and. Um, from an Ayurvedic perspective, those are carried forward from prior lives. Mm. So prior life development we, um, is, uh, is carried, spiritual development is carried forward. It doesn't always kick in right away. Some people start off being spiritual right away when they're kids, but some people, um, they, have, they have a karmic debt or some, something like that to take care of first. And then mm. at a certain point, suddenly they, they, they suddenly discover a teacher uh, or whatever like that, and then they wake up and the whole life just shifts. And, the emphasis changes and so on like that because whatever that was it's finished another interesting uh phenomena which you know is what it is there there are actually a significant you know i mean relatively significant portion of incarnations now that actually they in order to incarnate out of sort of a call and response uh situation they've taken on a portion of collective karma mm -hmm. so they didn't they weren't bound to this planetary cycle karmically, but they took on a portion in in order to incarnate. Yeah, yeah it's actually interesting. I, I hadn't recognized this before uh, my own process. Um, the, the dynamics were such that I, I did end up discovering uh, you know, some aspects of the karma in my life didn't make any sense from, from the nature mm -hmm. of my life. And so I ended up... Uh, discovering some uh, prior lives and and uh, and that made a lot of sense it's certainly not a necessary part of the spiritual path but for me it was an important clarification of what was going on and what this life was about uh, but uh, there was less attention on ancestral kinds of things I was certainly aware of some of that but but it wasn't as important but what's been happening for me more recently um, is uh, some of those ancestral dynamics became much more clear and it became clear to me that that um, the, to get this the particular life uh, birth that, that I, I got, there was an exchange uh, that I took on some ancestral karma in exchange for which uh, I got the life. And, and of course, the object of that is, of course, to work out some of that karma, but uh, oftentimes we're not all that successful. And mm -hmm. it took me into my 60s before I finally uh, <laughs> was able to complete some of that stuff and it kind of came to the surface so that, that I could. Um, it's been one of those, you know, lifetime desires that I've had for a long time. It's been there in the background and kind of pops to the surface every so often, but never seemed to go anywhere. And, and I was finally able to uh, complete that and, and uh, resolve this uh, trauma, trauma for you know going back several generations in, in my family. So it's interesting. Yeah, there's, there's all kinds of layers of, uh, there's our own stuff uh, from our own uh, history. There's the collective stuff and, and then there's uh, ancestral stuff coming in through the, the bloodline of our birth, we're kind of Ayurvedic perspective, it's kind of half and half, uh, our soul's development and our, and our, and the, the development of this, this, uh, the, the, 
the bloodline and the, the body mind we can get for the and, and of course there's a whole timing thing too is, is the getting, getting the optimum uh, birth time to come in and, and uh, uh, so we can work out that stuff and, and make spiritual progress and, uh, and so on and then of course we forget it all and, <laughs> right, yeah. and uh, get distracted and <laughs> stumble yeah. towards ecstasy as I used to say <laughs> Yeah, that's a great point you make about the ancestral uh, karma. I didn't have any real context for any of that as, uh, either. Or maybe you did, but uh, you said you just didn't give too much attention to it early on. But this, the same was here. Uh, the same was present here as far as not really giving too much attention to that. I always kind of um, generalized, you know, whatever was surfacing. Uh, and I think that that's uh, helpful. I think it's also helpful to have some you know, discernment to be able to see this is, you know, kind of linked to this and, you know, as, as something is becoming conscious and being brought into the light to be able to recognize the the structure of it and, you know, where the, you know, the link, the links of residue and everything along those lines. And uh, here recently, along with what you said, uh, within the sphere of uh, some resolution of an ancestral karma, it it also seems to be linked to uh, mask, you know, male female um, dynamics too. Uh, at least surfacing here, there's been a lot of uh, different what seems to be collective, but also on an ancestral level, um, the the dynamism between the male and the female. Uh, there's a lot of unresolved material there collectively, yeah. and uh, I speak about this concept called the sacred marriage, which is basically talking about masculine and feminine aspects of subjectivity being resolved into what you would refer to as unity or refined unity and what I refer to as uh, dynamic subjectivity. But um, that sacred marriage also does uh, translate into the field of form and activity. And so there is, a, there is something that is uh, sort of healing, we might say, collectively between the uh, within the sphere of the experiencing between uh, men and women and how that relates to archetypal family structures and you know all of those uh, all of those various things so right right because if we think of if we think of the uh, the context of consciousness being the source and expressing forward through us as vehicles to express that mm -hmm. then uh our, our own inner healing and resolving some of those dynamics is going to express forward into more um, loving relationships and, yeah. uh, and devotion being able to express right in the practical, in a, you know, in a, in a loving relationship and uh, mutual devotion, you know, the, the namaste and uh, yeah. the divine in me, I see the divine in you, uh, you know, that, that can be a living uh, reality as, as part of our life. Uh, if we're, making that spiritual progress, but also uh, healing the, the barriers to uh, emotional expression mm. and, uh, and those fine uh, feelings of devotion. Yeah, it's been, I, I'm, I uh, was raised by academics and, and uh, a very strong emphasis on the intellect and you know, my, my makeup here is also uh, oriented that way. Uh, which is handy in terms of the um, analysis and, and uh, <laughs> you know, give expression to some of that. Um, yeah. But, um, but uh, it, yeah, there's been a lot of learning to do on the, on the, the heart side. Also being a guy in, in our culture and that kind of stuff too. There's, there's yeah. uh, you know, I, I had to learn how to actually experience emotions again, you know, because it's like real boys don't cry and uh, not real boy, but just boys don't cry, and, and yeah. just, it's kind of like real man thing, and and uh, those kind of uh, messages we get from from uh, peers and and family and so on to be mm -hmm. the tough guy and and that, but but it's actually you know we're we're all both you know we exactly. you know, we have a dominant gender and and so on, but um, but we're all uh, comprised of both, and we're not going to find peace and happiness if we're we're way off base with what our own nature and who we are within That's i just want to make a correction too when i'm talking about that sacred marriage expressing into the field of activity also includes female to female dynamism and male to male dynamism not right. just yes good point yes yeah. I, uh, but uh yeah it's really uh, it's really amazing what 
what we witness unfold when we're willing to give attention to that which hasn't been given attention. And that's kind of what you were talking about there. It's, you know, when we have those uh, programs that say, you know, males don't do this or they're not, uh, that's, that's being weak or, or whatever the case may be. It's basically just a, a repression, suppression mechanism that's being put in place, you know, and yeah. Yeah. being willing to open up can be, can appear frightening because we don't, you know, many uh, haven't even kind of tasted what that's like, you know, they're like, well, what does that even mean? You know? Yeah. Well, one of the things for me here was huge, which took a long time to become conscious of, was I had this really strong provider meme that I needed to be of the provider. And um, and that was reinforced, by the way, you know, my father died when I was quite young. And, and there was sort of, so there's ideas of of what a male is supposed to be were more ideas than, than a direct example in that kind of way. Mm -hmm. And so I had this really strong thing about being a provider, but I didn't recognize that. And so at a certain point in my spiritual growth, uh, post-awakening, uh, it, it was basically organized to put me in a situation where I couldn't, you know. And so my, my work, uh, I, le I left a, a, a business scenario and uh, started my own uh, consulting business and, and tried several versions of that. Nothing ever went anywhere. And he said it went, went through this whole dynamic uh, of attempting to make it work and um, and ha having it not work and yet money was never a problem money would just show up from whatever and um uh and but i would you know they kept on you know wanting to, to it to be a certain way and, and there was a real strong thing in there about that and gradually it broke down and then finally when i when it when it resolved to a sufficient degree uh then it just kind of broke open and, and then i was able to do what i was supposed to be doing here and, and uh <laughs> And, and it just it just worked you know uh but it took a while you know there there was you know uh, there's a quality of trust that has to be in there to, to trust mm -hmm. and when we had experiences that you know we interpreted to be uh not being supported or or whatever because we were wanting to do something different than than life wanted uh, <laughs> or thought we were supposed to be something different than life wanted uh we can develop these uh, a lack of trust in being supported by um by nature of the world, um, others, and uh, so there's a, a relearning and a re uh, coming back in tune with who we are, and, and there's a, a, a relearning to trust, and also coming back to the beginning of our conversation, learning to trust the what's showing up in the experience, and um, you know, uh, uh, on that level as well. Yeah, that's a great point because I think many human beings uh, kind of are within the realm of trusting things that really aren't trustable so you know our trust goes to uh can oftentimes go towards things that are subject to fluctuation change you know and they're really unstable and that's kind of like what we're seeing you know we've we've been tasting collectively i guess for uh, this year uh, on some level and th that that's not the trust you're talking about you're talking about a trust in 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 reality in a more essential uh fundamental way yes fundamental knowing of what we are and that's so it's really in a way it's like growing naked i i like to look at it like that we we grow naked we grow out of those uh false safety features of feeling like these things are reliable uh, and if i'm not doing this it's not responsible or whatever the case may be right. and into this childlike maturity yeah this nakedness of of existence which is is still intelligent it's pure it's actually pure you know it's pure intelligence um but it it isn't fixed you know it isn't fixed and planned and detailed and laid out necessarily in the way that uh oftentimes the mind would like for it to be yeah and yet there is a beautiful intelligence to it but yeah. not necessarily an intelligence that we can recognize because it's an intelligence that isn't about us as an individual, because that's somewhat <laughs> delusional uh, that we're separate in any way. Uh, but but rather an intelligence that's doing all of it simultaneously, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and and matter of fact, is doing all of it simultaneously in all time, mm -hmm. all in the moment. You know, so it's so vast that <laughs> some, some personal value of mind could never. And not at all, it. right? But, yeah. <laughs> And it's, just, and it's it's just done, you know. It's just fine, and and there's a profound uh, intelligence to it, and and 
uh, structure and order, it, it, I mean, is in there. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, on the surface, it can seem like chaos and, and, and so on like that. Um, but, it's, but it's perspective. You know, it's just about perspective. And when we step back into the deeper, our deeper nature, then the the, uh, the deeper levels of reality unfold. And I mentioned earlier on about consciousness having those three aspects: the sort of the, the observer and the and the process of experience. The process of experience in there is what creates experiences. We mm -hmm. don't create our experiences; it's that process that's in there. What happens for us is how we interpret our experiences, how we respond to what happens. That's where we, where free will plays out and where we can get into trouble or or we work well with it um, but that quality is in there and so first we wake up to uh, that observer aspect typically but as you mentioned that sorry to have my side, but, but first we wake up to Dahlia <laughs> and we wake up to the other side of it yes um, and, and, and into one wholeness uh, but then uh, uh, in, into refined unity, we wake up to that intelligence aspect more. And it can come earlier in, in qualities of, intuity, uh, of intuition and, and mm -hmm. uh, the intellect, which was associated with the mind before, becomes associated with that pure being and, mm. and stability. And so it becomes much clearer and more discriminating. Um, and, but what, what happens is the, the, that intelligence aspect, the most subtle aspect of, of consciousness, uh, wakes up and so when we have an experience it comes not just the experience but the intelligence of the experience what the experience is about it, it's its nature its qualities and so on like that mm -hmm. and then you know that we can gain much more uh, confidence and because <laughs> we can you know uh, we understand what the experience is for what it's about and mm -hmm. Uh, and and we see that we are the experiencing. We are on some yeah. level that is our that's our own intelligence, that's our own self. And exactly going back to what you said about trust, you know, with that resolute intellect, it, you know, these decisions are based in that spontaneous flow of knowing. You know, and yeah. really, we can make decisions very cleanly, very precisely, very much in alignment from that space of recognizing ourself as the as this field. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and and it, and also because it's it's based on something that's stable, uh, we can get go down into very very fine levels of it, of of being, and uh, clearly experience on that level. Whereas if we're kind of going like this all the time, it's really hard to to see what's smooth and and and, uh, uh, and just flowing and you know. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's those yeah. the currents, the flows that are kind of underneath what we see on the surface yeah. level as that. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. it, and I also found, too, that you can uh, actually kind of see a simultaneity of that in the way that it's coming through. And the experiencing, yeah. you know, begins to show up as a lively radiance. The radiance is lively and all right. of the flows uh, are ourself, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was like physics says that the world around us is constantly being recreated in every moment. Mm -hmm. and, and we can directly experience that. Yeah, uh, and it, 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 this flowing and aliveness and and so on like that, and just recreating it every moment. Um, I did want to mention one thing though: is uh, both of us have been using visual language. Um, mm -hmm. Both of us are, are more visual, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's important to understand that, that people don't aren't necessarily going to experience uh, in, in a visual way. Uh, okay. Some people are more oriented towards uh, sound and uh, vibration on, on that level, mm -hmm. and some are more oriented towards uh, feeling and uh, more somatic and, and mm -hmm. uh, bodily sensations and so on like that. And so the divine may initially unfold for us uh, as uh, profound feelings uh, mm -hmm. or, or just a, a, a sense of, of immense presence uh, uh, and so on. And someone who's more visual, uh, the, the visual sense is associated with the mind, uh, just on in terms of which levels function, how they interrelate. Uh, and so, someone who's visual tends to put things into words more easily mm -hmm. uh, than someone who's uh, 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 maybe in a kind of feeling value. It's maybe harder to give. So poetry might be a, a vehicle for that, oh, yeah. Um, yeah. or song. But um, it's hard to put that into words, but it's not necessarily, but, but if you, of, of those three I, I described, um, 
seeing is actually the most surface value of it. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> those, those flows and fine vibrations are actually the much more subtle um, and, and more profound. So it's, it, there's not a one, it's not that one is, is more superior or, or, or weaker or they each have their own qualities and advantages. And, yeah. and part of that unfolding is that we can start with our default uh, way and then open up into the other, other Beautiful. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say, that they're not yeah. to the exclusion of the others, right? And yeah. There's a, yeah. the capacity is for all yeah. three of those levels that you described to be present on to yeah. some degree. Yeah, where, where for me, the feeling level was less, less, uh, more, more, math, more uh, plugged up. <laughs> <laughs> Work was needed on that level. Uh, so, so, you know, the divine showed up on a, on a visual level to show me things because I wasn't going to get a feeling level at that point. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. And that goes back to the clearing that, uh, that you and I are both always talking about, you know, just giving, giving some attention where attention is due. And how valuable that is in the in this unfoldment. Yeah. Um, and everybody well. has and everybody has their, their unique combination of that's one of the things that's important to understand is it's, we're not all supposed to be the same. The whole idea of there being separate points of experience in this one wholeness is so all the detail can be brought out. Mm -hmm. And so each of us are designed slightly different mixtures of emphasis of laws of nature, so that we're going to experience the world in a different way. And we're going to have a little bit different perspective or a different point in that wholeness. And, uh, and it's by all of us together that wholeness becomes greater and more complete. And um, so each of us has, has, a, has qualities to bring to the whole and uh, ways of experiencing. Uh, uh, the, and the, so there's, there's our own uniqueness is, is not a mistake. It's, it's, it's <laughs> essentially why we're here. <laughs> uh, and yet we have that one a common uh, uh, underlying reality as well. Beautiful. Yeah, that is a, that's a really great point. And one more thing I wanted to mention while we're here together is, uh, you know, sometimes you write about cognition and in your book, you, you mentioned it. And uh, you have some uh, beautiful descriptions there, explanations of what that term is pointing to. And uh, many read your, your blog and and are able to tune into to those cognitions that you're describing there. And uh, I just wondered if you would just say a few words about that and kind of the, you know, the spontaneity of it and how it's not necessarily something, uh, well, it's definitely not something that is done or, or um, occurs for everyone in the midst of this process. Right. Right, sure. Yeah, um, my teacher, Maharishi Mahashogi, um, he, he said that everybody can realize, but not everybody will cognize. Mm. Uh, cognize is kind of a different style of experience, the way I'm using the word. Um, when you have that resolute intellect, where the intellect is associated with, with, with the unchanging, it mm -hmm. becomes quite stable. Um, it creates a platform for um, uh, experiencing uh, reality, but in a in a in a holistic way. It's it's hard to describe exactly, but okay. essentially, um, if I uh, experience this pen, mm -hmm. I can look at it and I see it on this side, and I can turn it over and see it on that side. Yeah. If I was to cognize the pen, I would see it on all sides simultaneously. I would see its entire history and, mm -hmm. and everything it's made of, and and uh, and how it was made, and it, like. It's a, to a totality of experience of that mm -hmm. object, yeah. um, and um, and so the core of the Vedic tradition that, that I, I um, lean towards uh, is a, a uh, set of books that uh, well they're now books, uh, but they're a set of, of cognitions of these ancient seers mm -hmm. of the nature of reality, and they were in the in, impending dark age uh, a fellow named Vyasa uh, sat down and brought the primary ones together and organized them into into these uh, groupings and, and wrote them down which was considered unnecessary at that point it was passed on well originally it was passed on just mentally but then it was passed on orally and then and then um, it's grosser and grosser and grosser. Yeah, that, was a, that was an interesting thing that, before, that we think we think of writing as an advancement in our in our in human development but it's actually a, a, because we're 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 getting worse 
uh, our consciousness is going down. And so we, we, uh, he, he wrote them down so that they would be saved. But they're, they're actually encoded experiences. Mm-hmm. And so the Vedas exist in kind of like a, kind of the, the idea of the Akashic Records is kind of like this, there's a more subtle level where, where there's these core, it's kind of like a blueprint of mm-hmm. creation. Mm-hmm. And the way I have experienced it is that, that at certain points in, the, in, the, in an apparent time sequence, the next stage of evolution of the universe is, is its time. And so a being comes forth with, with certain abilities to have a cognition, and that makes it alive in collective consciousness. Mm. And so there's kind of like these, these um, three, is it three? I can't remember. But um, I think there's the three styles of cognition. There's the, the basic cognition, which is when someone comes along and, and experiences remembers the experience someone else has, has had. It's like there's a cognition that's alive in, mm-hmm. in group consciousness, and they yeah. have that same cognition. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like a basic style. And then there's a person who revives uh, a, a cognition or an aspect of nature that's gone dormant. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, because the, the nature work, work uh, moves in cycles, we talked on that a little bit briefly. They think of the seasons, you know, when we have rising and falling seasons in that sense of, you know, um, um, in cycles, and so in a in a when we go into a, a darker cycle, uh, collective consciousness becomes more shadowed, and some of the laws of nature uh, essentially go to sleep, um, mm-hmm. become dormant, and and so those aspects of of, of uh, nature and that that cognition goes quiet, and so there's a, a type of cognizer that comes along who revives a dormant uh, a dormant com- cognition, and then the highest type. Are the uh, original cognizers who who uh, who uh, have the first experience of that? But when you get to that level, um, it gets really kind of bizarre because at that level is prior to time and space, and and uh, so the idea that it was before anything, or that it happened at a certain point in time, is meaningless, uh, mm-hmm. or that there is a uh, that it didn't exist prior to their experience it, it, mm-hmm. because it was part of the original blueprint. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like, it, there, there, so there is those names of, of famous sages who had those co- original cognitions that, you know, awoke those laws of nature um, in creation. Uh, but at, at that point, it sort of gets into the, uh, the boundaries are a little obscure in there. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah. There was actually a point where they, they, they did that anyways. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, it kind of ties back into what we were talking about earlier in terms of uh, certain things becoming more prominent. You know, we were, we were referring to the feminine uh, aspect uh, shifts and then also looking at kind of how there is a greater fullness radiance in the field. So in terms of concealment and revelation, this is what I'm saying, right. how it ties together, is that certain things or certain aspects of reality appear to become concealed uh, in what is deemed to be a darker age. And then there's a period of what is uh, perceived to be revelation of the previously concealed, yeah? Right. And you look at it from a sequential uh, temporal viewpoint like that. Yes. And now we're in that, uh, we're, we're witnessing that the revelation of that which was previously concealed. And this includes uh, certain spiritual understandings. And uh, a part of that is surfacing on a collective level too of spiritual understandings which no longer are really uh in alignment so we could say they're kind of they've served their function and now they're kind of their shelf life is <laughs> their expiration date is already so when we see in particularly you know and we look at the non-dual kind of community at large and everything that's going on and in the field of awakening uh, and everything that's being presented there we're kind of seeing that uh purging of of some 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 things that were in place and effectively and efficiently in place and now through this process of of revelation of that which was previously concealed and kind of being pushed out in a certain way but that means that they're they're seeming to have you know some activity on the surface kind of bubbling there and or they're, and, being, or they're being upgraded in some way or they're being upgraded exactly yeah so it's not necessarily you know kicking them out or throwing them away with 
with the uh, expiration date <laughs> three months old, but that there's a new version. Yeah, totally. Of yeah, course. There's some of that as well, though. Yeah, both. And uh, the reason I brought up cognitions is, you know, you uh, here there was no context for anything like that. I didn't. Uh, I wasn't kind of informed in the way that you were, in that sense. And uh, that well, was a lot of this is not, nobody taught me about the three stages. That, that, oh, okay, okay. That, that became clear in just in. You yeah, know. but even the term cognition or, you know, I, uh, in the way things unfolded here, it was kind of like, oh, that doesn't, that, you know, that's not a, that those, you know, cognitions don't happen in certain cases or that's not, you know, and uh, so I think that it's helpful to, because in speaking about what we're speaking about with more brilliancy and light, you know, shining forth in the collective, the likelihood of cognitions becoming a little bit more of a regular affair uh, to a certain degree is present, yeah? Yes, very much. Well, one thing I've, I've noticed, I've written about it a few times, is, is that there are laws of nature breaking up, mm. and, which means someone has, has cognized them to, to stir them awake, essentially. Yeah. So I don't know who that person was, but I recognize that there's a law of nature <clears throat> yeah. breaking up. And then there's a the second stage of that. I, I saw that where the, law, the awake law of nature then integrates with existing laws, because mm. the laws don't work as individuals separate in that kind of way. They work in kind of teams and so on like mm. that. So there's kind of like a, a, the awakening process, and then there is the, the integration with the group, where, and then it's a collective synthesis. And then now there's a, a new thing that's happening um, that I'm, I've been seeing um, much more recently. Last year, I first started noticing, where when someone is able to embody uh, pure divinity that the because everything that's outside is inside right because uh, <laughs> yeah. our, 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 our apparent physical individual body is is also cosmic mm -hmm. it's a cosmic body of all bodies and all the bodies of everybody and all all beings all you know insects and angels and everything that's all in here mm -hmm. um and it's and out there is in here it's, it's both ways so when we start to embody pure divinity it's kind of like the body is filled up with white light kind of a thing but on a, on a, i mean that happens earlier as well because there's there's qualities at, at uh, earlier levels where that happens as well different types of that but it's like a on another whole nother level uh, in the post brahman stage and uh, essentially what that does is it mer it immerses the laws of nature in our physiology mm. in divinity mm. and uh, and so they're having spiritual awakenings mm. as a result of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what I saw that started last uh, last year, and then there's been a whole lot of purification going on since then, mm -hmm. because it's like, you know, it's just like when an individual wakes up um, spiritually, there can be uh, Adyashanti called the honeymoon. There could be a nice pleasant period but then you, you've created this big open space so anything that hasn't been healed or resolved yet rushes forward to be to be seen um, and it really varies by a person but but sometimes people get into going through a real wave of, of uh, purification mm -hmm. that's kind of happening on the collective level uh, at the moment so there's a lot of stuff rising to the surface to be seen and, and, and uh, cleared um, so it's a good thing, but it's it's uh, a lot of people don't understand that that's what's happening and mm -hmm. don't know how to heal or let go, and so it's creating a lot of drama and, and fear and uh, yeah and so on. Um, now the the, um, uh, the the other part of that process too is that when those when those devas are are waking up in the local experience then that awakening falls back into the collective mm -hmm. uh their collective value because it's sort of like there's these point values that are that express forward as this this physiology right um but they're also collective the laws of nature are all collective and so that so that awakening happens in the apparent local body which is cosmic falls back into the cosmic and then expresses forward into all forms mm. So it's a whole other level of waking up the whole that's started to take place now. So it's not just individual lighthouses waking up and, and raising the collective consciousness. Mm -hmm. And because it's the same consciousness for everybody, all boats are, are lifted. Yeah. Um, 
now there's another value that's taking place where not laws are not just waking up from slumber they're spirit, spiritually waking up mm. and so then they're they're going to go through a, whatever the deva version process of, of you know what we talk about is and uh and that they're part of the same you know group of consciousness also and so it's raising that on, from a whole other level beautiful yeah i would just make the point too for the you know for those listening that still going back to what you spoke about earlier in terms of uh, refined perception and the sort of default, you know, as far as visual and those kinds of things, what you're describing um, could take place on more of a feeling, uh, you know, it could be on more of a feeling level, uh, even on the level of uh, subtle sound as well, you know, as far as the dominant. Right, exactly. Yeah. So in this case, I'm visual. And so I'm, I'm, yeah. watching them watching it happening and, and being well at the time it was kind of like really you know <laughs> it, it, it uh because it's not kind of the uh anything i'd heard of or or you know it hasn't happened for a very long time so i guess mm-hmm. it's, it's but that's a new thing that's taking place because it's not there's a bunch of people that are that are in there and one of the things that happened um there's kind of a this in the stages of enlightenment there's kind of like th- two so there's a pair of three three sets so there's there's self-realization god consciousness and unity then the refinement of that but then and then there's the brahman uh refined brahman and para brahman and they're, they're kind of similar in certain ways in terms of the process and the uh, unity has several stages as i mentioned before and so does para brahman and just as i was finishing the first book it it came out that that uh para brahman had seven stages and uh, which uh, you know it's like really okay and so i kind of wrote it up and and put it in the book and and uh i, f- I fixed that and updated because i realized that that was a little bit off I, you know my understanding there wasn't enough clarity to get it quite right um uh in the first uh version so i refined that a little bit and I updated the what i have it on the website um as well um and um yeah, we just keep that's, updating. You know? so, yeah, so that's, yeah, so that's unfolding. Yeah, my, my stages, states of consciousness thing. I've I, I written three major articles on that. And, and mm-hmm. now, you know, I replaced the first one because I've rewritten it so many times. It was, you know, I got more clarity. And because I had these concepts about what it was supposed to be like and, and, and so on. And, and, and then as more and more people that I knew or uh, spoke to me about it or I, I saw them going through the shifts or whatever, um, then uh, you know I was able to fill out more information. You know, like um, Ajashanti talks about head, heart, gut as a kind of what I jokingly call the three um, egos. It's kind of like these three levels of of ego identification. Um, and we 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 lose the first one with the first with self-realization or cosmic consciousness. The second one is the with awakened heart, head, heart, gut, and the third is kind of this core or accident, existential identity in the gut. And I associated those with, with self-realization, God consciousness, and unity. I thought, you know, because that's what happened here. I just want to talk about it that way and, and so on. But that's part of the healing process and, and, and letting go. And it turns out you can, you can uh, go further in the stages before you've actually let those things go. Um, I know people who, like, like Suzanne Marie talked about letting go of the, the gut uh, contraction with her Brahman shift. And so we, we had this conversation about it because she, she'd had a Brahman shift and didn't quite understand what was going on and wasn't part of her tradition. Uh, but because she talked about the gut release, I assumed she'd had a unity shift, but we weren't quite synchronizing on that. And, but then she, it became clear to her later on. And, uh, um, and, and so she had it with the Brahman shift. But I know people who had their heart opening after Brahman uh, and so they haven't even got to the the the, the gut one yet, and uh, I think this is partly why you see uh, spiritual teachers, for example, get into weird identity problems at a certain point because they may have and they may have cleared the first one or two and that kind of stuff. But if that core identity is still in there, there's still a person, a quality of person that's running aspects of the boat, and and also can be. Um, um, yeah, basically creating a kind of a shadow on the experience. Yeah. yeah. In terms of what you were, uh, or going back to what you were saying about uh, the embodiment of pure divinity in, in the context of this head, heart, and gut, 
we can also recognize the the clear reflection or uh, situating of pure divinity on all three of these uh, levels as well, which of course would right. on some level require there being the, the limited uh, identification cleared from that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. From that. And of course there can be, you know, whatever individual variations on that, you know, some of course. Of them, and it's not that, that everyone is going to, uh, it's not that everyone's going to, you know, s see it or uh, con contextualize it according to those concepts, you know. And right, right. Yeah, like Ajashanti talked about having a two-week, what, what, what Bob Kelly called a barbecue, just this, because mm. the gut is the fire center, uh, the solar plexus chakra. And uh, so it was for him, it can be experienced as a real uh, roasting. And uh, it was a real big thing. Um, I wouldn't have even noticed it if it if it I hadn't just recently read about it or heard about it when in his discussion with Locke Kelly, and okay. then so when it happened, it was like oh, because it was for me it was it was relatively brief. Yeah, um, yeah. And it depends on on what clearing had already been done. However, I mean, I mean saying that, uh, I can also note that that there's been a considerable amount of of, um, of clearing since then in the lower chakras. It, it was, mm -hmm. That's where a lot of the the old garbage is <laughs> carried in those, those yeah. first three chakras. But yeah, this year has been uh, pretty uh, significant within that sphere here. Yeah, yeah. If you follow the Jyotish of Vedic astrology, it, it uh, the cycles of of the just the dynamics of what's going on in the sky. It's kind of a reflection of the cycles of time going on. Mm -hmm. um, it's been a uh, quite a. Uh, uh, well, a really good time for purification, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. But yeah, uh, but yeah it's, it's been an interesting period. Beautiful. Well, we've, uh, we've covered quite a bit <laughs> as usual and, uh, went places I didn't expect to go. <laughs> that's right. Uh, I think we, uh, we definitely set the stage for our next talk. Hint, hint. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, exploring, uh, exploring more together so really appreciate the the time apparent time spent always oh, yeah and I, I really value the conversations too it's always really interesting what comes out of this and, and it uh, meets a different audience as well so, yes beautiful I need to hear this yeah. so maybe we'll just uh acknowledge the glory of pure divinity yes all glory all glory. Thank you.